huge crabs bite into the bed of the river to make the hole even deeper. A regular traffic of barges carried the chalk and mud downriver and dumped it at sea. Water pressure meant that the great steel walls had to be prevented from collapse by four sets of rectangular girders. A team of 60 divers, working often in zero visibility below the surface, were needed to check the walls, a job which quite literally meant feeling for trouble. Once the excavation work is complete, a large plug of concrete is poured underwater to form a firm base for the pier. Day and night, the concrete pour continued until the required depth was reached. Finally, once the concrete is set firm, the water is pumped out of the coffer dam. This is Pier 7. And it was here that the engineers faced the biggest problem of all. In addition to rock-hard chalk, there was an added complication. Water was still seeping below the five-metre thickness of concrete. With great ingenuity, the fault was sealed, but these extra problems meant a further loss of precious time. Progress in those early years was indeed slow and frustrating. Apart from these technical difficulties, there were also labour problems. The GLC wanted to get the work speeded up. A revised work programme was drawn up and the Port of London Authority were persuaded to relax their navigational requirements. They had originally insisted on a 400-foot channel always being open for river traffic. Now they said it could be narrower, allowing more of the river to be taken up by construction work. In the early stages, two 12-hour shifts were worked, and this was the root cause of low productivity. It was demanding, tiring, uncomfortable, and dangerous work. can be a very unfriendly place at two o'clock on a cold, wet winter morning. Tempers can expect to be short, and the smallest difficulty can soon fester into big trouble. Everything came to a head in 1977 with a two-month-long strike, which completely halted all construction work on site. It was the lowest ebb of the whole project. Conditions improved when agreement was finally reached for a three-shift system each of eight hours. Morale and output started to improve. GLC pressure had finally paid off. As the contractors wrestled with the accumulating problems of labour unrest and technical difficulties, nature stepped in to remind everyone that further delay could be catastrophic. In this room, on a raw winter night in January 1978, the GLC staff watched anxiously as the graphs charted a dangerous surge tide. Whipped up by 80 mile an hour winds in the North Sea, the tide came to within two inches of the 1953 level. It would have been a close call had it not been for the interim bank raising. The GLC flood warning system also had a poor response from the public. Despite repeated siren tests throughout the 70s, Few people realised what they meant. A powerful campaign was launched to make Londoners fully aware of the menace on their doorsteps and gave them details and instructions on what to do if disaster actually threatened.
The Thames can hold just so much. A sudden surge tide and London could be flooded. If you live, work or travel in London, make sure you know the flood drill. Ask for details now. The high tides of mid-January 1978 were a clear warning that despite all the bank raising, London was still extremely vulnerable. When flooding did occur, the result was more an inconvenience than anything else. The GLC's interim bank raising scheme proved reasonably effective. The extra inches on top of the wall certainly didn't spoil the view. But it was obvious to everyone that completion of the barrier itself had to be an urgent priority. This is the cause of the whole problem. If a depression forms out in the Atlantic and moves round the north of Scotland, a dangerous situation develops in the North Sea, particularly if strong winds come on top of a high tide. A hump of water, rather like an upside down saucer, forces its way down towards the narrow gap between England and the continent and is simultaneously driven up all the river estuaries, including the Thames. It's called a surge tide, and it can be as much as four meters above normal tide level. And that's not all. London is also sinking on its bed of clay. Tide levels are getting higher, and the southeast of England is tilting downwards. The combined effect of all these could mean a disaster for London of unimaginable proportions. Although bank raising had clearly been an effective deterrent against flooding in the past, the possibility of adding as much as six feet to the river walls in some places just wasn't viable. If the embankment was so high that people couldn't see over the top, then clearly the River Thames as a tourist attraction would be seriously affected. raising has always been an essential feature of the Thames flood barrier scheme. All the way from Woolwich to the sea at South End, the banks have been raised by steel sheet piling or earthworks. The total cost, 250 million pounds, spread among the GLC, central government and the regional water authorities. has also been carried out upstream. It was begun in 1971 as an interim defence and was necessary because of the abnormal upland flows of water coming down the Thames. Sometimes it was the raised wall in the back garden of a riverside home. On other occasions the contract demanded months of work along the busy stretch of the river. places like Strand on the Green here, there was a powerful and understandable lobby not to have any protection whatsoever. The river was right at the front door, and in most cases it's hard to spot the solution, whatever it was. It had to blend in with the surroundings. Whatever solution was finally adopted, at least some of the schemes won deserved recognition. During those early years of construction, the underwater concrete sills were made on the huge area of reclaimed land on the North Shore. This was the biggest cofferdam of all, covering an area far greater than a football pitch. 
The main purpose of the sills is to form a sort of cradle on the riverbed. The gates then fit snugly in these huge concrete grooves below the surface. The sills were constructed around a wooden frame, and the surface had to be so smooth that the only way to achieve this was to do it by hand. There was no guarantee that machines could do the job just as well. side of the sills are the enormous iron tubes which eventually form the main passageways under the barrier itself. They link with every pier and also carry the miles of electrical cable. Floating out of the sills was probably one of the most critical and significant operations of the whole barrier project. The coffer dam had to be flooded and then the steel piles removed to enable each sill to be pulled by tugs into the river. Naturally enough, this event created more than a passing interest. What, in fact, the engineers were being asked to do was to drag a huge lump of concrete out into the middle of the River Thames and to sink it in exactly the right spot. To say it required precision planning and navigational skill is an understatement. But there was one factor which they had no control over, the weather. The winds and the tide had to be just right. And fortunately, they were. The largest sills weigh over 10,000 tonnes each and are 200 feet long. These were anxious moments all right, because when the sills were finally in place, there was just two inches to spare at either end. 